Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about postpartum depression. Now, I know what you might be thinking, stay out of your lane. I don't have a vagina or vagina. But this is going to be continuing my block of mental illness slash disorders. It might be my last one of this series and I might go back to TV and movie stuff, but I felt I had to get these this block of uh, mental illnesses out of the way it was important to me. But because of technical things like what's in the bank, you know, things I have already edited and what I'm putting out when it might not be the last, but in general, it should be. This will be a link in the description for the National Library of Medicine. This is more of an educational uh, article, let's say. In a sense that there's not many opinions in it. It's more of an educational thing that they'll put out. There's even links in here. A lot of the articles have highlighted links, underlined, and those lead you to other links where you can sometimes verify or get a deeper dive into a certain topic. Now, again, I put the link in the description as always. This one I can give some credit to because it says here um, the authors are Saba Mughat. Yusra, Asha, and Wakwa Siddiqui. So kudos for them. This one doesn't have a listen to button because some of these have a thing where you can click it and actually hear people talk about it because I am notorious for fucking up the human language, especially medical terms and stuff. But again, this will be on postpartum depression and I'll begin. Around one in seven women can develop postpartum depression, PPD. While women experiencing baby blues tend to recover quickly, PPD tends to last longer and severely affects women's ability to return to normal function. PPD affects the mother and her relationship with the infant. Maternal brain response and behavior are compromised in PPD. According to Beck in 2006, as many as half of PPD in new mothers go undiagnosed because of conflict in privacy and not wanting to disclose to close family members. There is also a stigma around new mothers in that disclosure may lead to abandonment and fear of lack of support. This activity reviews the evaluation, treatment, and complications of postpartum depression and underscores the importance of an interprofessional team approach to its management. So the objectives would be to describe common symptoms of postpartum depression, Articulate the reasons that women may not seek care for postpartum depression. Review management strategies for postpartum depression. And plan a discussion amongst interprofessional, interprofessional team members regarding the de de detection, evaluation, and management of postpartum depression so that this condition can be detected quickly and appropriate management can be implemented immediately, enhancing patient outcomes. Childbirth is a difficult and exhausting process. A female goes through a lot of hormonal, physical, emotional, and psychological changes throughout pregnancy. Tremendous changes can occur in the mother's familial and interpersonal world. After childbirth, a mother can experience varied emotions ranging from joy and pleasure to sadness and crying bouts. These feelings of sadness and tearfulness are called baby blues, and they tend to decrease over the first two weeks after delivery. Around one in seven women can develop postpartum depression, PPD. While women experiencing baby blues tend to recover quickly, PPD tends to last longer and it severely affects a woman's ability to return to normal function. Now, this is a repeat of what was up. So, okay, well. <laughs> PPD affects a mother. Uh, according to, yeah, we did that. There's also, yeah, we did that. All right. Ideology. PPD can occur in families having depression and anxiety in a Trimester of pregnancy. Risk factors. Psychological history of depression and anxiety. Premenstrual syndrome, PMS. Negative attitude towards the baby. The reluctance of baby's gender. And history of sexual abuse and pertinent factors in, uh, for developing postpartum depression. 
uh, a risk factor, a risk pregnancy, which includes emergency cesarean section and hospitalizations during pregnancy, meconium passage, umbilical cord prolapse, preterm or low birth infant, and low hemoglobin are associated with PPD. The social factors, a lack of social support can cause postpartum depression, domestic violence in the form of spousal and sexual and physical, and verbal abuse can also be a causative factor in the development of the disease. Wow, I said they put sexual and physical and verbal. Hmm. People are surprised. Anyway, I'll continue. Smoking during pregnancy is a risk factor for developing PPD. Lifestyle is eating habits, sleep cycle, physical activities, and exercise may affect postpartum depression. Vitamin B6 has been known to be involved in postpartum depression via its conversion to tryptophan, uh, tryptophan and later on serotonin, which in turn affects mood. Your sleep cycle is among the factors influencing the risk of depression. It is evident that decreased sleep is associated with postpartum depression. Physical activity and exercise decrease depressive symptoms. Exercise decreases low self-esteem caused by depression. Exercise increases endogenous endorphins and opioids, which brings positive effects on mental health. This also improves self-confidence and increases problem-solving capacity and helps in focusing on their surrounding environment. Epidemiology Postpartum depression most commonly occurs within six weeks after childbirth. PPD occurs in about 6.5% to 20% of women. It occurs more commonly in adolescent females, mothers who deliver premature infants, and women living in urban areas. African American and Hispanic mothers reported the onset of symptoms within two weeks of delivery, unlike white mothers who reported the onset of symptoms later, one study reports. Pathophysiology. The pathogenesis of postpartum depression is currently unknown. It has been suggested that genetics, hormonal, and psychological and social life stresses play a role in the development of PPD. The role of reproductive hormones in depressive behavior suggests neuroendocrine pathophysiology for PPD. There is ample data to advocate that changes in the reproductive hormones stimulate the dysregulation of these hormones in sensitive women. The pathophysiology of PPD can be caused by alterations of multiple biological and endocrine symptoms. For example, systems. For example, the immunologic, immune, immuno, immunological system of a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, <laughs> adrenal axis, HPA, Fuck. I was trying to cover up my fuck ups from before, but okay. And lactogenic hormones. The hypothalamic <laughs> pituitary adrenal axis, HPA, is known to be involved in the disease process of postpartum depression. The HPA axis causes the release of cortisol in trauma and stress. And if the HPA axis function is not normal, then the response decreases the release of <laughs> catecholamines, catecholamines leading to a poor stress response. HPA releasing hormones increase during pregnancy and remain elevated up to 12 weeks after childbirth. The rapid changes in reproductive hormones like <laughs> estradiol and progressed. Uh, Progress, uh, progress the tone. <laughs> Woo! Getting right to it, I guess. Following delivery can be potential stressor in susceptible women. And these changes can lead to the onset of depressive symptoms. Oxycontin and prolactin also play an important role in the pathogenesis of PPD. These hormones regulate the milk letdown reflex as well as the synthesis of breast milk. It is often observed the failure to lactate and the onset of PPD occur at the same time. Low levels of oxy oxycotin are particularly observed in PPD and unwanted early warning, weaning. Unwanted early weaning. 
During the third trimester, lower levels of oxycodone are associated with increased depressive symptoms during pregnancy and following delivery. History and physical. Postpartum depression is diagnosed when, a, when at least five depressive symptoms are present for at least two weeks. In the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, postpartum depression is considered when a patient has a major depressive episode along with the peripartum onset, and it is not mentioned as a separate disease. By definition, it is defined as a major depressive episode with the onset of pregnancy or within four weeks of delivery. The nine symptoms are present almost every day and represent a change from the previous routine. The diagnosis should include other depression or acolonia, acodonia, loss of interest, in addition to the five symptoms to be diagnosed. And they give a list. Depressive mood, subjective or observed, is present most of the day. Loss of interest or pleasure, most of the day. Insomnia or hypersomnia. Psychomotor retardation or agitation. Worthlessness or guilt, loss of sleep, loss of energy or fatigue, suicidal thoughts or attempt and recurrent thoughts of death, impaired concentration or indecisiveness, change in weight or appetite, weight change 5% over one month. These symptoms can lead to significant distress and or impairment. Furthermore, these symptoms are not attributable to a substance or medical condition. The psychotic disorder does not cause the episode, nor has been a prior manic or hypomanic episode. In the 10th revision of the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, the ICD-10, a postpartum onset is defined to be within six weeks after delivery. ICD-10 describes a depressive episode as follows. In a typical Mild, moderate, or severe depressive episodes, the patient has a depressed mood with a decrease in activity and energy. Capacity for enjoyment, interest, and concentration is reduced. The patient feels very tired after the minimum effort, along with sleep disturbance and a decreased appetite. Guilt or worthlessness are common pre uh, present, along with reduced self-esteem and self-confidence. Somatic symptoms, such as... Oh boy... Anhedonia, usually walking in the very early morning, along with agitation, weight loss, loss of libido, decreased appetite, and marked psychomotor retardation. These symptoms vary little from day to day and are not responsive to circumstances. A depressive episode may be classified as mild, moderate, or severe, and it depends on the severity and number of the symptoms. The signs and symptoms of PPD are identical to non Puperal depression with additional history of childbirth. Symptoms include depressive mood, loss of interest, changes in sleep patterns, changes in appetite, feelings of worthlessness, inability to concentrate, and suicidal ideation. Women may also experience anxiety. Patients having PPD may also have psychotic symptoms, which include delusions and hallucinations. Voices saying to harm infants is one of the examples in parentheses. PPD may lead to poor maternal infant bonds, failure of, failure of breastfeeding, negative par parenting practices, martial discord, as well as worse outcomes concerning the child's physical and psychological development. The remission of symptoms will reduce the risk of behavioral and psych psychiatric problems in the offspring. A prior episode of PPD increases the future risk of major depression, bipolar disorder, and PPD. Past personal and family histories of postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis should also be noted. Uh, to go evaluation. During the evaluation, it is important to include drug and alcohol history, smoking habits, and all prescription and over-the-counter drug medications. Screening for PPD can be done two to six months after childbirth. There are several screening tools available, and one of the most frequently used is the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, EPDS. It is a 10-item questionnaire filled out by patients and takes a few minutes to complete. An EPDS cutoff score equal to or greater than 13 is required to determine 
if patients are at risk for developing PPD. This screening test provides the basis for additional clinical tests. The objectives of the clinical evaluation are to con constitute the diagnosis, assess suicidal and homicidal risks. Wow. In this case, usually infanticide and rule out other psychiatric illnesses. Wow, man, what a fucking... Ooh, but <laughs> yes, I will interject my two cents, which is sometimes just shock, stupidity, you know. Treatment management. First-time treatment for periopartum depression is psychotherapy and antidepressant medications. Psychosocial and psychological psychotherapy is the first-time treatment opinion for women with mild to moderate post uh, peripartum depression, especially if mothers are hesitant about starting on medications that are going to nurse the newborn. A combination of therapy and antidepressant drugs is recommended for women with moderate to severe depression. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, are the first choice. Consider switching to serotonin norepinephrine re reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, or Mirazepam, if SSRI is ineffective. Once an effective dose is reached, continue treatment for 6 to 12 months to prevent relapse of symptoms. Pharmacologic recommendations for women who are lactating should include discussing the benefits of breastfeeding, the risks of antidepressant use during lactation, and the risk of untreated illness. Repetitive Transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, is treatment that may provide an alternative option for women who breastfeed and are concerned about their babies being exposed to medication. There is more data for the use of cetraline for the prevention and treatment of postpartum depression. The risk of breastfeeding while taking a serotonin reuptake inhibitor is relatively low, and women can be encouraged to breastfeed while on antidepressants. After 12 weeks, CBT uh, monotherapy was formed, was found to be remarkable in both cetrian monotherapy and combination therapy. The CBT monotherapy, monotherapy group found the most accelerated initial gains after treatment startup. An important factor in the duration of postpartum depression is delayed treatment. Ooh, okay, transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. It's a procedure that is non-invasive and uses magnetic waves to stimulate and activate nerve cells. The cells are underactive in people with major depression. It is usually done five times a week for four to six weeks to be effective. It is done in patients who are not responding well to antidepressants and psychotherapy. Generally, TMS is safe and well tolerated, but there can be some side effects which include headaches, light headedness, scalp discomfort, and facial muscle twitching. Some serious side effects are rare, including seizures, hearing loss if ear protection is not adequate, and mania in people with bipolar disorder. Mm, well, I guess I gotta be honest, but that's a little scary. Patients with severe postpartum depression may not respond to psychotherapy and pharmacosep pharmacotherapy for patients refractory to four consecutive medication trials. ECT is recommended. ECT is particularly useful in patients with psychotic depression with intent or plans on committing suicide or infant infanticide, infanticide and refusal to eat leading to malnutrition and dehydration. Several observational studies have suggested ECT as a safer option for lactating mothers as there are fewer adverse effects on both the mother and the infant. For patients with severe postpartum depression that decline or do not respond to ECT, intravenous or brexonanolone is recommended. Brexonanolone received FDA approval in March 2019 and is the first drug to be specifically approved for postpartum depression. Brexonoline is an Aqueous formation of allopregnanolone. A progesterone. <laughs> Holy shit. Metabolite. 
<sighs> Brexanolone is only recommended if patients do not improve on antidepressants or ECT due to its restricted availability and limited clinical experience. In the United States, Brexanolone is only available at certified healthcare facilities and patients are required to enroll in the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy Program. Though this program, patients are commonly monitored by a clinician during their IV infusion for increased sed sedative effects, sudden loss of consciousness, and hypoxia. Brexanolone is administered intravenously as a common uh, continuous 60-hour infusion, which lasts approximately two to five days. Multiple clinical trials demonstrate that Brexanolone is usually well tolerated in women with moderate to severe postpartum depression and can provide rapid beneficial response. More clinical trials are needed to further assess the long-term safety and efficacy of Brexanolone in the treatment of postpartum depression. Wow. Uh, we got a differential diagnosis of baby blues. Uh, they talk about most commonly around two to five days. It's delivery resolves around 10 to 10 to 14 days. Women experience crying bouts, sadness, anxiety, irritability, sleep disturbance, appetite changes, confusion, and fatigue. It does not affect daily functioning or the ability to take care of the baby. Uh, hypothyroidism or hypo... Well, just these names, but hypothyroidism. <laughs> these conditions can also lead to mood disorders. They can be assessed by testing TA, TSH and free T4 levels. Postpartum psychosis. Postpartum psychosis is a psychiatric emergency with a potential suicide or infant infanticidal risk. A female can experience hallucinations, lack of sleep for several nights, agitation, unusual behavior, and delusions. It is an acute onset of manic or depressive psychosis within the first few days or weeks after delivery. Postpartum depression has repercussions beyond physical harm to the child. Data reveals that conditions also affect mother-infant bonding. Often the child is treated inappropriately with very negative attitude. This can have a significant impact on the growth and development of the child. Children born to mothers with postpartum depression have been found to exhibit marked changes in behavior, altered cognitive development, and early onset of depressive illness. More important, these children are often obese and have dysfunction in social interactions. Complications. Postpartum depression affects the mother, father, and infant. For the mother, it can lead to chronic depressive disorder if not treated on time. Even if treated, PPD can be a risk for future episodes of major depression. For the father, it can be the precipitating factor for depression in the father, as this will be a stressful event over the entire family. For the infant, the children of mothers who have untreated depression can develop behavioral and emotional problems. More commonly seen are delays in language development. They can also suffer from sleeping problems, eating difficulties, excessive crying, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. I did a podcast on that. Pearls and other issues. Uh, before delivery, many females who are at risk of developing PPD can be identified. These females, along with their families, should be provided with information and educational education regarding PPD penality. The information should be reinforced during postpartum hospitalization and after discharge. Childbirth education classes teach new mothers to seek help and support that they might need for childbirth. By teaching women and their spouses about the signs and symptoms of PPD, educators can increase the chance that the women suffering will receive proper management and treatment. Screening for depressive symptoms can be done during pregnancy. This screening can identify women who are at risk, increased risk for developing PPD. Exclusive breastfeeding has a positive effect on reducing depressive symptoms from childbirth to three months. Postpartum depression can be prevented when parents are given positive parenting lessons and when the maternal infant bond is promoted and increased. This can be achieved through social support and family and healthcare providers. Along with this, good maternal sleep can also help in preventing PPD. Uh, enhancing healthcare team outcomes. Because of the high mor morbidity of postpartum depression, the focus today is now on 
prevent, preventatory. Unlike psychiatrists, the nurse is a primary position to identify women at high risk for postpartum mood disorders before delivery. During the admission, the nurse may identify the female with a prior history of depression and postpartum blues. Further, any female who develops depression during pregnancy should be identified and closely followed by the postpartum nurse or primary care provider. These women need education and support on available treatments. Some of these women may benefit from a consult with a therapist, and others may need referral to a psychiatrist for treatment with an antidepressant after delivery. Both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical propraxilis have been used in such settings with variable success. There is also a large body of evidence that postpartum women with depression who are treated have a much better mother-infant bonding experience than those who forego treatment. More important, infants or mothers who are depressed may also develop a variety of mood and behavioral problems, as well as obesity later in life. Despite awareness of postpartum depression, many women miss out on the treatment because they are simply not followed after pregnancy. Thus, the role of postpartum visiting nurse is critical. Unfortunately, there are no good randomized clinical trials that show that screening postpartum women for depression is of any benefit. While the topic remains debatable, there are many small case series revealing that the treatment of postpartum women for depression is of some benefit. As to which type of therapy is ideal for these women is still not known. Wow. Okay. Again, I stay out of my lane. I murdered the English language, but it's a this is life and women giving birth, depression, all these signs. I hope in some way, you know, it helps somebody. Again, I say this about almost every one of these things I've done. You know, we know people. There are your friends, your friends of friends, your family, cousins. Uh, these things are sometimes go unnoticed, as it states, and following up afterwards. Maybe it takes, you know, some people just to understand what it is. They listen to a podcast or they read the article themselves because this mook from Brooklyn is murdering the language. In any case, it's just something to think about what women have to go to give birth. And even if you look at the odds of the, the, the percentage and the numbers of the people in this world, it's... It's hard to think about a lot of women just going through this and it's supposed to be such a wonderful time. Again, I gotta stay out of my fucking lane. I'd rather just read this as an information thing, more of a obviously an educational, a difference between just reading like a um, opinion piece on it. So there we go. Uh, my heart goes out to anybody suffering from postpartum depression. Get help. Hopefully, people around you support. And that's important, obviously, in a lot of these things. If it's our friends and family, your know, healthcare providers, nurses, it just seems, you know, really important. And again, I can't equate these things and say I know how people feel about it, but, you know, it's just so many people in this world and it's out there. People should learn about it, get an informed opinion, and I hope that's what these podcasts help do. Hope everybody's having a great summer, depending on how I put these out. I love you all. My best to you and yours.